Winnipeg, my first time headed your way. I'll be there Friday, March 1st, and Saturday, March 2nd. Omaha, we're going to do it this time, I promise you. Last time we got our flights canceled, this time we're taking a straight shot. I'll be there Friday, March 29th, and Saturday, March 30th. Columbus, Ohio, I'm fired up to head your way. Never been there my first time coming to your beautiful city. I'll be there Friday, April 12th, and Saturday, April 13th. Los Angeles, I'm excited to announce that I'm part of the Netflix is a Joke Festival. I have my own show Sunday, May 12th at the Bourbon Room. You guys ask me, how come you're not on Netflix? Well, here's a chance to sell this thing out and show them why I should be. Get your tickets now. Don't wait. All tickets available at ryansickler.com. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pan Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all your social media. <clears throat> Excuse me there. I don't want to start this episode like I start all the episodes. I want to say thank you. Thank you to every single one of you out there that watches, listens, subscribes, comments, however you help the show. Thank you very much. And if you got to have more, then you got to have the Patreon. It's called The Honeydew with Y'all. And it's this show with y'all and the stories just get. Cr- OK, here's a quick sample. 1994 or five. If you're old enough to remember, my guest today is there was a little baby in Indiana called Baby Hope. This little baby was born and found in a dumpster stabbed with an umbilical cord and um, placenta fresh in this dumpster. Never found out who did it. This kid's mom is walking them around the neighborhood going, look at this, look at this. Finds out just three years ago, that baby was his sister and his mom had died, but she was involved in it. And we got the whole story. It's still a cold case. It's just stuff like that over and over week after week. It's wild. So also check out the way back right here on my YouTube, the new podcast where we go back in time and just have a little fun in that backseat of the station wagon. And uh, for dates, ryansickler.com. That's where you can get everything. Now, you know what we're doing over here. I always say we highlight the low lights and that these are the stories behind the storytellers. I am very excited to have this guest on here. First time on The Honeydew, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Reggie Watts. Welcome to The Honeydew, Reggie Watts. Hi, hello. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. I love it. Um, before we get into your story, please plug, promote everything and anything you'd like. Oh, geez. Plug, promote. Uh, well, I have, I have a, I'm going to plug, promote, guys, right now. I have a book that came out uh, October 7th, I guess. Some of the, no, October 17th, called uh, Great Falls, Montana, uh, uh, Post-Punk Weirdos and the Tale of Coming Home Again. And it's basically about my, it's a autobiography and mostly centers around my high school experience uh, and delves a little bit, you know, past that. But it mostly focuses on my group of friends from high school. So that that's out. Right now, you can get it wherever. Uh, I would encourage go to a local bookstore, order from there. Um, and then um, I have a special that I'm going to be filming in March for the Veeps platform, which is a new platform started by the two brothers who were uh, from Good Charlotte. So, oh, yeah? yeah? The so, band? Yeah. Oh, okay. So they started this new uh, subscription kind of a la carte. Uh, platform. Wait, are they the, the twins, Benji and... I, th- I don't know if they're twins, but they're brothers. They might be twins. I think they're Maryland guys. Oh, okay. I might be wrong. Did one of them marry Nicole Richie? Am I thinking the, of the, the wrong that, band? Uh, it could be. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I remember Good I just Charlotte. like seeing people getting involved in different things. So they got a network coming? They got it. Yeah, they got they They have a bunch of specials coming out. I think I think David Cross has a special coming out oh, great. on there, and he's uh, been on the do. And someone, else, yeah, some other, some other people, but they're getting like a bunch of comedians for for specials, and then they have they bought a bunch of con- content from people, and it's also music, so live music performances on the Veeps platform. So should be pretty cool. It's brand new, um, but at least I get to make a. I've been trying to make a do a comedy special for years. It's this just, your first one? No, this will be my fourth. Oh, okay, but, I was gonna say, but yeah, but the last one was like 2014 on netflix so uh but yeah i'm stoked you know so i get to make a new special and i'm I'm really excited about that so that's that's those are the immediate things coming out 
Good for you. I want to ask you this just about a book in general, because one of my goals just I always feel like, oh, I just want to be published. I want to write something about my life or whatever. Did you find it? Would you do it again? Like writing a book. I've talked to so many people and some of them are 50 50 like, man, it's so much and it's a lot of work. And, you know, is it is it like that? Uh, grind where it's a passion project more than anything else? Or do you find that it was, you know, that it hit you personally? What was it? I mean, I, you know, I wasn't really interested in writing a book. You know, I, 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 um, yeah, I just, whenever I thought about writing a book, it just seemed like way too, it's just, uh, just Mount Everest in front of you. You know, I'm like, I don't think I could do that. And I'm not much of a reader. Uh, I mean, I research a lot. I, I read a lot of research, but, um, science and art stuff but like i just i'm not really a reader so i was like well, i don't know if i'm the right guy to you know come out of the book but then i thought about my life story and uh and then wanted to make a film or a series about my high school experiences in montana in the 80s and so my management uh, my team were like yeah well you know the be- one of the best ways to kind of help with that is to write a book about it because then people can read it and get a picture of that mm-hmm. possibility in their heads and so yeah so that's how i went and i got a, a ghost writer um really really great guy um similar sensibilities to me i made sure similar age came from the midwest and then even though great falls montana is the west it's got a midwest vibe to it um, and my dad's from cleveland so there's a, a lot in common with that writer and he's an amazing uh writer and we work together to create this book and uh, I would definitely do it again. I, yeah. I, I want to do the next book I want to do is Seattle, Washington, and then next one, New York, New York, and next one, LA, California. So let's talk about your life story because I'm also curious why you chose that high school chunk. Because I feel like if I, I know that would be the chunk of life I would write about as well. Yeah. Because so much happened to me in that time period, good and bad. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious. Tell me a little bit about like where you grew up and getting into uh, Montana. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, moved there from Europe. My dad was in the military, and we moved, I moved there when I was, I think, three and a half or four. You were born in Europe? I was born in Europe. Where? Yeah. In Stuttgart, uh, where they build Porsches. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, where the <laughs> business offices of Porsches are there. They actually build the Porsches in Zuffenhausen. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I was born there. We moved around Europe. My mother's French from France, and... Uh, yeah, we ended up in Spain for most of that time that we were in Europe, and then um, then moved to uh, Great Falls in 1976. Yeah. 19- so, what age do you hit Great Falls? I was like four, I think, because I was born in 72. So, I mean, what a what a difference, you know? Yeah. If for four years, you're seeing all sorts of people of race, color, everything. Yes. And then you go to Montana, and I imagine it's uh, as white yeah, as it's, the snow, it's, bro. It's so white. <laughs> It's like ninety eight percent. I think ninety eight percent white is the populace. Well, if you look the, it up, that's statistical. it's crazy. It's so white. Ninety eight percent. Ninety eight percent. Ninety eight percent. Ninety eight percent. But the, you know, the funny because like gl- moving to Great Falls, that's about as cosmopolitan as you get. It's still ninety eight percent, but you got like nine black kids throughout my school thing. So that could have fluctuated. There could have been like four one year and then like- But how know. many in your actual grade? You're talking about your in, high school? In my grade? Four grades? I don't think I had, I had Ludi Gomez who was Filipino um, in my class. I don't think I had another, there wasn't another black student. I don't think so. Um, I You're mean, telling did, me in your whole high school class, the only two people of color are you and that Filipino dude? No, no, no. Not in the high school. No, this was elementary school. So elementary Still. school. Yeah, grade school. There were probably some other kids in lower grades. But in my actual class, like I think Ludi was my probably the only person of color. And there may have been – there were a lot of like half Euro kids, you know, because of the base. So you get like half Greek. Oh, I see. Half, yeah, yeah. Half, there was, I had my friend Tony Beard. Well, he goes by Lou now. But um, – in high school when I met him, his mother's uh, Thai. So he was half Thai, um, half white. And so there was a lot of like half white, half European of different ethnicities uh, that popped up here and there. But straight up black students, I mean, yeah, it was about like eight or seven to nine probably at any given time. So, you know, but the weird thing is like, there was some racism, but 
and I maybe it's just my memory. Maybe I'm just selectively like making everything positive, but like I didn't really have that many problems. Uh, I'm sure people were being weird to me because of the way I looked, but I kind of chose not to see it. So I would just address people just straight to their face like a regular person. And that's probably the most effective way anyways, because they're just like, what's going on here? And you're just like, oh, hey, I was just hanging out with uh, Tom down there. Do you guys have any uh, shipping supplies? Uh, oh, okay. Well, yeah, we got it. And, they, they, and then they just forget. Yeah, yeah they forget. <laughs> they're like, damn, damn it. I was supposed that was my chance. They and I fucked it up. <laughs> it's like, God damn it. <laughs> Fuck. He goes home and he has like a huge conversation with his wife. It's like, I, 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 I fucked up. Happened. I fucked I up. Fucked. It was my one chance. There's not that many of them in town. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if he's passing uh, through or if he lives here. Yeah, I, don't I don't know. know. <laughs> and then he, we end up having a good conversation. I don't know what's going on here, man. I'm sorry. Maybe I was wrong. <laughs> well, it's mine down there. <laughs> it's crazy. Crazy. That's an interesting thought to think, too. Like, you're a lot of people's probably first black friend. That's true. Yeah, I never. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. But yeah, that's yeah. true. Holy shit! Totally true. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I'm sure. So it's, I'm sorry, your mom's French, born yeah. in France. Is, did mm-hmm. they meet over in Europe in yeah. the military? So yeah. then you guys all come back to the states. Why? There's a base there. You said, yeah, yeah. Air Force Base, Malmstrom. And then do you live there in Montana from what four years old till 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 I graduate? Till you get out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what's was, that like? I mean, honestly, now you get past elementary school and yeah. middle school and stuff because high school is where it really. Yeah, it high school's where it's well. at. Yeah, I was stoked about high school. I was super ready. And are for you it. moving through school with all the same guys all the way yeah. through? So you guys Mostly. all know. Yeah, yeah. I'd say that's, like that's probably eighty percent of the people that you're in school with, you're still in school with as you're moving up through those grades. And how big's your like um, high school? You had a big school, a lot of kids. It was, I think, thirteen hundred kids. Hmm. Thirteen hundred. That's not small. It's not small. It's uh, not Texas or anything. But no. I feel like that's what we were in Maryland. Yeah, I mean, I've met friends that have like three thousand kids in their high yeah, school, thirty five hundred, but you know, bigger. But you're talking about like East Coast kind of or more East, bigger cities. But uh, we ha- we also had another high school across town, which was really it was perfect. You know, we had like a rival high school, yeah. and they were I think roughly about the same size, like eleven hundred, twelve hundred kids. So we had like rival sports teams and, you know, they lived across the river, you know, it it was kind of a perfect, you couldn't get, it it felt like if there was a real live Sims game, like Great Falls is a Sim city. I mean, it was perfect. You're like, okay, well, here's this plot of land. It's next to a river. It's like, oh, okay, well, what should, what should should we build there? Well, let's build a dam there and get some power going. Okay, cool. And so add some neighborhoods here. Uh, and, uh, oh, let's make sure rail lines are coming through there, enough rail lines, and uh, maybe we'll start a smelter right over here on the river. We'll start smelting copper, and maybe this will be like the trade route of the West. You know, there'll be like the Chicago of the West. Everything comes through here. Oh, no, the Great Depression hits. Uh, oh, shit. And then the government's like, we should put a base here. And they're like, okay, we're going to put an Air Force base here. What's the Air Force? I don't know. It's new. started in 1956. <laughs> I was like, well, Some let's just put shit. one there. And then, it, and, and you know, put a base. Yeah. Okay, we got, oh, how about a cannery over here? Okay, let's add a cannery over here that'll help the income you know whatever but like an international airport like it's just it's very it's it's cute it's just like a contained town like you drive 15 minutes any direction from the center of town and you're out of the town it sounds like it's a snow globe town yeah totally that's a yeah. perfect way of thinking of it yeah that's exactly that because you're like here's a city and then you, you literally just drive and suddenly wheat fields like, oh, is there a city? I don't know. I think there's a city behind this. Well, let's turn around. Yeah, the city's still there. It's it's a very contained. What's uh, the closest place. major city, and how far is it? I mean, gosh, I mean the ma- a major city. I mean, the, probably a bigger city would have been Billings, which would have yeah. been a hundred and twenty thousand. So would have been like twice the population of Great Falls. So that's the biggest city in yeah, Montana. Yeah, I've Billings and Whitefish. I've been there. Yeah, yeah, Billings. But is, you're farther out than that, huh? Well, we're right in the middle. Oh, you're in the center. So it's okay. like it's like center, slightly west, uh, right in the middle of the state. And then, yeah, and then we have Missoula, which is kind of down. We have Bozeman, Billings. Those are the biggest cities in Montana. It's Every- different. We went to a karaoke. Well, we went to a bar that I didn't know they had karaoke. It was wasn't necessary. Let me let me backtrack here. We went to a local bar. And it wasn't karaoke. It was a local band. And Whitefish? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this guy was the son-in-law of the dude who owned it. So he had to play. And he was not great at all. But everybody's out there country line dancing and stuff. And the wall 
the three walls all the way around. I'm, you probably, maybe you've been there. Mm -hmm. And I'm not exaggerating when I say this. It's a stuffed buffalo. Yeah, of course. It's a fucking ram. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it's massive. It's an, it looked like the fucking Smithsonian, like yeah. with the little uh, like tumbleweed behind it. Mm -hmm. They made a little display. Mm -hmm. And it's just massive animals yeah. all the way around. I was like, holy shit. What? This is different. Yeah. It's, Did you hunt and fish up there? I, you know, I, I, I tried, I think I went duck hunting once with my, my, luckily my neighbors across the street, that's actually something I don't think I gave them enough credit for. Uh, I was really thankful. My, my neighbors across the street, they were, they were from North Dakota originally. And I, I don't know what religion they were, but I think that they were like some kind of, kind of subsect Christian religion of some sort. Never quite found out, but his name was Robbie and we were friends and we would play Star Wars all the time. And he had like an older sister that was kind of a bad, a bad girl, which later it's like, she wasn't a bad girl. She was just like, loved having adventures, you know, but back when we were kids are like, oh, she's doing stuff you're not supposed to, you know, so she's bad. Um, but well, yeah, we played Star Wars. Uh, we had so much fun together and his father went fishing a lot. So we'd go fishing uh, in their little you know, truck bed camper. And we'd, we'd all had our, you know, dad took the upper one and we had like the two side beds and get up early in the morning, get in the boat and go fishing. So I went fishing a lot. I didn't mind that. But when we went duck hunting once, I was not feeling that. I just, and luckily we didn't get any ducks. They, they, they got nothing that day. And I was so stoked because I just, even though I ate meat, like I, the killing of the animal, oh, yeah. I could, I just, and it sucks because it's like, I'm a hypocrite, you know, like I, I enjoy chicken, but like, well, actually I did kill a chicken once in France. I worked in a market um, when I was visiting my relatives and I would like, you just. Did you have to catch you it just, first? Yeah. You just pick them up and you. Oh, this thing the, wasn't running and like chasing. No, it. no. It was just like in a cage. And, and you like, really do just snap. And you're them holding in. it by the feet and you're like this for this much money. And I figured out a way to kind of bypass that you know, that like, I don't want to kill something. And I did it like for a day or two. And I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't do this anymore. So that, that was as close as close as I got. So as a Montana and maybe my mon fellow Montana friends are like, Oh, what a wuss. But like, I just, I, I wasn't, but I mean, I'd go into my friend's garage and there'd be a, an elk hanging from the rafters, an elk. you know, yes. with, you know, with the horn still on and the antler still and, 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 you know, tons of cardboard on the floor and like you know everyone has a deep freezer and they all have a gun room oh yeah for sure yeah gun, gun a buddy room. took me down a gun room and he opened it up and it wasn't just guns it was it was moose and elk antlers yeah just on the floor and shit yeah, like, yeah, yeah. what are you doing with these i know i know well, it's just like it's that it's that <laughs> hunting culture that just like i don't know what it is you know you just it just is the way that it is but i used to go to school kids had guns on in the gun racks on, okay. in their trucks yeah and so um I want to say it was my freshman year was 87 and then everything changed after that it was last year. I'm a freshman in high school. It was the last year we actually had a smoking lounge in the school. We wow. Had a, yeah, we had a room where if you're 18 or I always say or had shit trash parents, yeah. you could smoke in there. Um, and then there was the racks. You you couldn't come with a pistol or anything. Sure. But if you drove in and you had the gun rack back yeah. here and you had a shotgun or a rifle in there, nobody said a word. I know. And they weren't even locked. No, it was literally you could walk in and go, look at this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't believe that. Probably and had ammunition in it because everybody's 17 and fucking dumb. Yes, yeah. I know. Yeah, it's true. I never had an incident. Never, ever had an incident. We never, uh, kids would have knives, you know, pocket knives. Mm -hmm. Like no one in Montana, everybody's got a knife. I mean, most Western states. That makes states, sense. Yeah, you know, you makes just, sense. I still carry a knife. Uh, I, I always have a knife. I always have a knife and a flashlight. It was just like kind of my Boy Scout shit. But uh you just have a knife and you can look at anybody's pocket and you'll see that worn down spot yeah. where someone's clipping their knife or whatever. And it's just a normal thing. Or sometimes people have buck knives, you know, they're like hanging yeah, off their belts, whatever. They're, and no one ever says anything. Like I was in Missoula for a punk festival that they used to have um, every year. It was so cool called Total Fest and it's no longer. But amazing bands would show up there and you'd have like people just walking out of bars with their full pint glasses of beer just walking across the street big ass knives hanging out and i'm like that's sick and then and then when and then when people have like these like misunderstandings about <clears throat> people who live in cities and you know people that you would classify as liberal and people that you classify as as conservative which to me is all a bunch of fucking bullshit but uh 
they don't understand. They're like, weapons are dangerous. And it's like, yeah, that's true. However, if you go to Montana and you're like in Missoula and you've got a knife and you're walking around with your pint, pint it's like, of course, they're going to be like, no, they're not dangerous because we live in it every day and we're, we're not having problems with it. But then someone in the city is like, yeah, but someone got stabbed yesterday because some psycho or whatever. It's like, yeah, but there's two different areas, it's two different styles of being. So there can't be a blanket solution for everything. And you also said a key word in there, some psycho. Yes. These are not normal people no. walking around town enjoying responsibly, P.S., enjoying yeah. an alcoholic beverage. Yes, exactly. There are people who can drink and have a weapon. Yes. And do yes. nothing with it. A hundred percent. At all. Except 100%. for go home with it safely. Yes, exactly. A hundred percent. Or you like needed to whittle something. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's like, oh, what do you, you need? You need, <laughs> you know, I, you, God, you just made me think of something. There used to, like, I grew up in, in, uh, I'm from Baltimore originally, but after a while, we moved out to the county. Yeah. And it was country as shit out there. Yeah. And I remember redneck dudes taking their buck knife. God, you just made me think of this. Have you ever seen yeah. anybody cut their nails? With oh, like yeah. That? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just, Shave I don't down. remember who the guy was. He's just watching him. I'm like, are you cutting your fucking nails? Like, yeah, I'm just cutting them off. I'm like, yeah. with a buck knife. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Cause it's like, you're, it's like, uh, you know, it's like the modern day version of a, you know, like a knight or something back in the medieval ages. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. you had a dagger, you know, or something yeah. and like you just had it. And that was like your tool. It wasn't like you're not. It's not when we see a weapon. Yeah. I mean, if you have a tactical switchblade or whatever, it's like that's what I like to carry. But like it, but I just like it because it's convenient. It's like it's the blade is out. The blade is gone, like back in my pocket. Yep. I like it for convenience, but but I'm not thinking like this thing would kill so many people. I'm just like, this is a cool tool. And all my friends are that way. So, you know, it's it's funny. My liberal friends, I guess you'd call them liberal in Montana that are just about like <laughs> treating people fairly. I guess that's liberal, which is just stupid. Yeah, that's, so stupid. that's what liberal is there. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, no, everybody ought to be able to do whatever they want. No, give a fuck. Right. Like yeah. that's liberal there. Yeah. But they're like, but they're still like, no, I still want my guns. Yeah. I still want my knives. It's yeah. like, is I that support liberal? Gay marriage, it's like, but no. I want this. I want this AR. Yeah, right? I want this <laughs> AR. It's like, OK, I want to build it because I like it. It's techno. So I just got a stamp. I can I can do silencer. I can do suppressor, whatever. And you're just like, oh, OK, that's good. But. The balance just makes sense there where you're like, okay, I won't fuck with you. You don't fuck with me. Great. Done. Right. But uh, so most of my friends who come down like from Montana who are visiting L.A., they're kind of they're tripped out by like everyone's hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. to, but I'm not against that because it's just a product of the environment. So like, you know, when I think about growing up in Montana, I'm lucky. I felt like, well, one, we grew up in a time, I think the best time to grow up ever personally and it's not Agreed. me just being like a pre-boomer or whatever but like uh being able to like have that freedom of like going to school with your pocket knife being able to whittle stuff you know on the playground after whatever and then um you know the alcohol thing like you were taught they're talking about like canada was like up you know so if you were like 17 had a fake id or whatever you could like cruise up there or i think in canada at the time it was maybe it was maybe 16 or something like that. Anyways, we would go up there or uh, I didn't, but friends would go up there to go drinking. I wasn't a big drinker. So I'd go up there, go drink it, take road trips by yourself, no cell phones, uh, a lot of responsibility. You had to kind of raise yourself in many ways. Uh, and Montana itself just being wide open possibilities. Like we'd go hiking on the weekend and be like, hey, let's go backpacking up in the mountains. Just two or three friends with backpacks in the winter it's like freezing and our parents just drop us off and okay we'll see you in three days really oh yeah all the time tell me um let's talk about high school because i'm curious like where do you party are you guys doing field parties if you don't have a house i imagine field parties are probably pretty yeah. big in montana i mean for like the popular kids like the most of the 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 yeah, the average party kid, it would definitely be out in a field somewhere. And he'd be like, oh, it's out by Ryan, Ryan Dam. Uh, okay, let's go but let's go to Ryan Dam uh, out in this field. It's like, we take first right here and then take a left at the sign. We're going to put a little thing there so you know that it's our thing and whatever. So that would be it. But then sometimes we'd have house parties. But when I, when I met my new group of friends, my kind of like post-punk weirdo friends, like my skater friends, my BMX friends, my road bike friends friends the you know the girls that were like listening to Susie and the banshees and like all the the dark goth stuff and that crew like we always found our own places so we'd party in caves we had there these caves that we found that we would like party in what kind of caves though and animals probably in there right then they weren't they weren't um natural caves they were mining 
shafts. Oh, okay. Right. So we called them the caves, but they were like, it was a granite mine, an old granite mine. Um, and we'd have to sneak there because there was a house that lived across the dirt road from it. Um, cause they, it went up a pretty steep hill and there were like these cliff faces. And somebody and, was actually in the house. And they, and they, they would, had. yeah, and they had the porch light and they had dogs. So sometimes oh, we'd have shit. to park really far away and then cut into the land along the cliff face and then just like quietly make our way there so the dogs wouldn't bark. But, um, you know, we'd go there, there'd be a person's, you know, parents that were out of town. So we'd go to that house or my mom was cool with having the kids like hang out in the backyard and park in the front. And like, we'd hang out in the basement they'd smoke in the house. Cause my mom was a smoker and really, yeah, I didn't like it. I didn't like my mom's, uh, my parents, I made my friends smoke outside, but sometimes my friends would be upstairs smoking with my mom talking to her. Um, and, uh, it was just like, I don't know. It was, it was chill. We could party wherever. Like we, we had, we had options or we'd go over to a friend's house. Like sometimes in the middle of winter, it'd be like, we're going to Bozeman. It's like, how, how long is it going to take to drive there? Oh, about four hours. Uh, do we have four by fours? No, we don't have four by fours. All this like BS, like people are like, I got to have an SUV. I have to have a four by four. And all these people like going hardcore on four by fours. Oh, I live out in the mountains. I'm going to need four by four. I had a Renault 18i. <laughs> you did not. I had, a, I had a Renault 18i. My friend had a Renault 12. <laughs> Why is it, because they were they had french moms so like the french moms had french cars you know and we had a renault dealership I remember that you remember car. that shit yeah yeah, yeah renault dude. 12 renault 18 i La car. Car. La car. La car. La car. La car. you're telling me that car got around in montana in the winter easy that little french thing. easy yeah that's yeah, yeah. crazy isn't that crazy like was that, it rear wheel drive front wheel drive it was you had to have front wheel drive at least for and winter. you would fucking get it in that thing yeah we huh? just we went on the freeways and you know we had you know we put on chains you know whatever but that car took me everywhere. So all this, like, all this, like, I gotta be high up and I gotta have four by four and 30 inches of clearance and all that. It's just <laughs> a bunch of garbage. Unless you actually live up a super steep grade with mm -hmm. like rocks and you whatever. Grind yeah, they, I, I get it, right? But like this whole fascination that people have, especially even in Montana, like people not from Montana moving to Montana, I need a truck. It's like, you don't need a truck, man. You're not, what are you, are you hauling shit? You're That's barely it. hauling you anything. Hauling it? it just like, becomes a neighborhood dumpster. People yeah. just throw shit I know, in like, oh, here. here's a garbage. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I don't want a truck. I want a nice cabin that I can put my friends comfortably in and we can just like drive and have a comfortable ride. These trucks are not comfortable rides. But anyways, that my diatribe aside, yeah, we were just like, we had so much freedom back then. The Honeydew is sponsored by BetterHelp. A common misconception about relationships is that they have to be easy to be right. But sometimes the best ones happen when both people put in the work to make them great. Therapy can be a place to work through the challenges you face in all of your relationships, whether it's with your friends, work, your significant other, or anyone. You've heard me talk about therapy on here a lot. Um, I've mentioned that when my daughter almost got hit by a car, just anxiety, I just came unhinged. I went to therapy and it worked. You know, I was scared of heights, scared of flying. Now I fall asleep on my planes and I live on a higher floor. So it works. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It is designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and then you switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Honeydew today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Honeydew. Now, let's get back to the dip. So what was it that hit you and impacted you in such a way that you decided to write this book about that chunk of your life? What's going on at that time? I mean, you know, I. Is it a good time? Is it a mixture of both? No, I mean, I mean, for the most part, it was great because I was, you know, luckily, again, perfect timing when I was in junior. You might have had the same timing, but when I was in junior high, uh, 16 Candles came out. Mm -hmm. 16 Candles was awesome. There was nothing else like it. Like, and I remember seeing it in the movie theater. I was, I don't know, what, what, how old are you, 14 or whatever? And I was 14, went to a matinee. It was like a free ticket or something. Like if you're underage, you could go to this thing for free. And I went to a matinee. My mom used to drop me off all the time to see matinees at Cine 4. And uh, it doesn't exist anymore. But I went there three o'clock in the afternoon, no kids in there. Oh, well, like two other kids in there. So it's just like three people watching this movie. And it blew my mind. I was like, holy crap, this is, man, imagine if, could it be like that? Could could life be like that? 
and the music was cool. Yeah. The kids were interesting and weird. And Joan Cusack had, you know, headgear on and couldn't drink out of a <laughs> drinking fountain. It was, it was awesome. And just like, you know, getting underwear and like my, you know, um, my uh, long duck dong, long in duck there. dong, which I've met that guy Have in you real really? life. Yeah. 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 He's, he's amazing. He's really sweet. But, you know, it's incredible, incredible it's, thing. It's so funny because my daughter, um, She's nine now, but last year she had this knot in her hair that, like, the hairdresser spent three hours. I was like, oh, I yeah. can't get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what are we going to do? And the hairdresser's like my age. And I'm like, we're going to 16. It's a straight up. We're going to 16. Remember? She got the yeah. hair in the oh, door and right. they just cut it. Oh, my God. So she's right. like, I can cut that chunk, but I can do my best to layer, like, areas around yeah, it so yeah. it doesn't look like that girl yes. that they just cut her fucking hair. Oh, my God. That sticks in my well, head. I like, don't know why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. She was so pumped. Yeah. Oh, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I showed her on YouTube, like, this is what we're about to do to your hair. It's so it's, it's wild. It's a that's amazing. But that movie was like crazy. It was like so super inspirational. And that prepared me for high school. So when I was like, oh, I'm about to go into high school, and this movie came out exactly at the right time. I, you know, got into high school and I was like, ah, oh. and then high school breakfast club came out mm -hmm. um and then you had ferris bueller's day off you had uh some kind of wonderful um three o'clock high um oh, better off dead better off dead still yeah i mean like buddy and three o'clock high and better off dead with the still two dollars i mean there's still $2. i still have friends that'll every now and then hit me up with yeah, two like, dollars <laughs> oh two and the dollars. asian dude that did the perfect howard cosell oh my yes yeah, perfect like, here we are <laughs> at the finish line again we have Lane, you know, whatever, whatever. He crushed it. I mean, it he was amazing. It. And he puts on the fucking, the, the dishwashing gloves <laughs> and puts the car in reverse. Oh, shit. I mean, it was awesome. Yeah, those legendary. Were, those were awesome. And uh, Weird Science, which Ooh, I watched mm -hmm, like 13 times. Mm -hmm. So all of those movies, it was all about was high such school. such an Anthony Michael that, Hall that, fan. That was crazy. Too. Yeah, of course. And Robert Downey Jr. And they yeah. even went to SNL together for one of those down seasons. That's right. They yeah. did, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a huge phenomenon back then. And teenagers never had anything like that no. before. He had like... Porky's was like, yeah, but and it that was, was when we were even a little younger. Yeah, I was, I was, I was you know, too, a little bit too young for that. Fifties gym stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, can I see the girls? And whereas, like Hughes movies were more about the what were the girls thinking about? You know, right. uh, what were the guys thinking yeah. about? What were they worried about? What do girls' underpants look like? Yeah, what do they we're look not, like? This, we're not peeking in and seeing Bush in the shower yeah. like Porky. Yeah. No, no. There was, was mystery there. It was like mystery, <laughs> yeah. and it was also absurd. Yeah. It was silly, and it was like heightened, and it was weird. <laughs> that door open and held those underwear. Oh, my God. It was just like that, and it was like, oh. Ah, yeah. Which is kind of true. It's like, if that were to happen, that's like everything uh, you've yeah. ever imagined. Yeah. As, like, as, as a boy, you're like, or no, or whatever, but dudes anyways. in the trunk because some big muscular guy said that's where you're going if you want to go to this party. There yeah. are plenty of kids. I'm like, okay, okay. We're, okay. Yeah, I guess that's where I go. That's where I'm going. Like, that is where you go. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I mean, we had all this like color cultural instruction. Like the possibilities were laid out in these films, and um, and when I got, and I I think I had that experience in high school. It really felt like. I got to experience those movies. I lived those bits of those movies in high school with my friends and we had incredible adventures and we learned about each other and yeah, and there were like some dark things, but we were there for each other and we got ourselves through some, you know, some heaviness with cool, responsible, weirdo, psychedelic partying, you know, um, and, and amazing music. And so that's, I wanted to kind of capture that and transmit it and, just to have a document of it, but I'm really interested in making it into a film or a series because I think it would be cool to see that. Like, you know, what was it like to hang out when you don't have, I mean, obviously every every comedian probably wants to do a movie about their high school experience, but Freaks and Geeks, you know, prime example. But I think like mine would be a cool angle. Like, you know, a, I think that's enough weird things happen that I don't think people even believe happened, but, yeah. but they did. You know, it's like that's because it was the product of the time. We were able to do that. And your dad's a military man, like a lifer. Is he in the military for a career man? He was he was in the Air Force. He retired when I was like like nine or something like that. Um, so, yeah, he was. Yeah, he retired from the Air Force. But he was in the Army before the Air Force. He, Damn. Sw he switched to the Air Force. Oh, wow. And then your mom, what did she do? She when we first got to Montana, she sold Avon. 
Hey, God damn, you are taking me <laughs> back, bro. <laughs> I forgot about Avon. King I remember seeing my mom and her friends would sell that shit or yeah. have Tupperware had parties. all these par- products in the house. Yeah. Like tons of products tons. in the house. And then people would come over and be like, I'll buy that. I'll yeah. buy that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And they would, or she would go door to door selling Avon. She did that. And then she got into uh, cleaning houses for the, for the Air Force Base. And so she was a housing, house cleaning or a cleaning contractor. Um, and she became like the best on the base. So she was constantly working and she's such a hard worker. So she'd get up at like four in the morning and would be off to go do a house, you know, and damn, and come back at like, you know, five in the afternoon when I'd be, I'd already be home from school. And um, yeah, she worked her ass off. And, but she loved getting cool stuff, you know, so she was ordering cool porcelain Liadro statues and, um, you know, cool furniture. And um, so she she worked really hard and was one of the providers for the house. You know, my dad provided and my mom provided. Were they, they were together the entire time? They were together until I was turned 13. I started getting into almost fights with my dad, just a lot of resistance. You? Yeah. Why? Because he was a, he, well, he came from a disciplinarian household, uh, you know, being, in the black community in Cleveland, Ohio, and his father lost his father when he was younger. Um, the father was murdered, um, and then Man. and then he and then his new stepfather was very strict and religious, like a Baptist. And so uh, I think he just and his mother, his grandma, or his his mother was also very strict as well. So I think he came from that, and he was trying to use that method on me. But I was kind of like a smart ass kid that was always trying to get in and out of stuff by being tricky and i yeah i was just anti-authoritarian you know so when he started trying to get up in my face about like doing stuff i started resisting more and more and then i got to a point where my mom thought like this could get bad so i'm gonna send him away and so she sent my dad away and said like you you gotta you got to go. And so he. Like, did they divorce or she's no, just like, you got to get out Catholic, of here. She's Catholic, so she doesn't okay, believe in divorce. Sure. But they. But he it's just like, you can't be in this house. You can't be in this house. So he, I think he ended up uh, going to school for uh, business management in Arizona. And uh, so he went there and then he ended up moving to Cleveland because his mother was getting older. So it timed out all right. He, she, he needed to be there to, to help take care of his, his mother. And I would go visit him on, you know, summers and, and sometimes he'd come to Great Falls for like Christmas, um, but he would go back. And I think it was a good call on her part. I think it's kind of crazy, you know, to like be a parent and go like, I'm making this decision. And you got to go. Yeah, you got to go. I love you, but this is, we got to. But also he didn't stay local. He decided, all right, I'm going to go. Yeah, he he really went. He like, went. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> he really He really went. Yeah, he was like, "I'm out of here," but yeah. I'm glad. I, I mean, I I don't think I would I wouldn't I wouldn't have wanted him to stay. I I got a little bit more freedom, mm-hmm. and and I loved my mom. You know, even so though just I, you and your mom. Do you have siblings? The, no, no, just you and your mom at this point. From what eighth grade, ninth grade on? Yeah, yeah. So basically, junior high and high school, my dad wasn't there. He came for graduation, obviously, and then he stayed. You say, obviously. You know how many people sat in that chair? People don't show up for weddings, graduations. A lot, dude. A lot. That is true. That is true. There's a lot. He he was cool. I mean, I I will say that, like I say, he did the best he could with what he had. And Mm -hmm. he was a vet. He was in Vietnam. He had PTSD. There was a lot of shit going on with that guy. So I, so even when I think about him today, I'm never and your like, mom probably oh, really, dad sucked. Yeah. Your mom probably really did you a favor shielding you from totally. any of that. Totally. Absolutely. So then you're just you and your mom, but you say your mom's working all the time. So you're a latchkey kid or you just let mm-hmm. yourself in and out and you guys sort of see each other for dinner or in the yeah. evening and that's about it. Are you in yeah. sports in and music and stuff? All, or were you always home pretty much? Uh, no, I was doing music. I mean, I started uh taking violin lessons in fifth grade i think with linda lydiard and uh she taught the the stringed instruments i think another teacher taught horns and woodwinds um and 
and then timpani and stuff like that. And then in junior high, I was in orchestra. So there was an orchestra program in junior high. So I was an or- orchestra in junior high. And I was also an orchestra in high school. And so I did that. But I also studied piano from age five to 16, classical piano, private lessons um, with a crew of students that we all grew up. Was that a family thing or is that something you wanted to do? Like did your oh, mom and dad to do play? It. Were they musically inclined? No, not at all. <laughs> no. They love music. But yeah. They, they, my dad played a little saxophone when he was a teenager, but that was it. He was a big, you know, Charlie Parker fan. But, um, you know, he got in the military and, and did that. But he, they always loved music. They loved hanging out and partying and, you know, enjoying life. Um, but they, lo- they loved it very much. So I took to it. I, I really liked it. It was very natural. And, uh, yeah, so I studied tons of music and got involved in as many after school or extracurricular programs possible. I, I did, you know, speech and debate a little bit. I did, um, there was, a uh, art classes, um, I don't know, just random shit. Uh, I was always trying out everything. I just loved being social and trying stuff and being involved in stuff and still feel relatively the same these days, you know, the way that I'm social, but yeah, it was, it was, it was actually perfect timing. All all of it worked out having that extra time, having really good programs in school to get involved in if you wanted to. And because the school system at that time was very well funded Mm -hmm. um, and we had access to whatever we needed as kids. It was awesome. So, when you you get you graduate and then you leave mom stays in montana yeah and dad is where now back in cleveland he, still he moves back to montana he comes back yeah after his mom passes uh your grandma he, well my grandma didn't pass till later but uh but he moved back like as soon as i graduated basically to be with your mom or mm-hmm. no he did yeah they got back together yeah of course they never were you said apart. of course <laughs> Well, because I hear you. They're not divorced. They're not but. divorced. Yeah. He, she just sent him away. That's okay. all. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So he comes back and yeah. now they're a couple again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and how live, does that work together? Them? Does that work out? It works great. I mean, but he's also getting sick or he gets emphysema. He had like some heart operations. You know, he's just. Uh, was he a smoker? Is that He was Vietnam a heavy smoker. Shit. Yeah. He was a heavy or smoker, both. heavy drinker. Um, not heavy drinker. I don't think he was an alcoholic, but they definitely enjoyed alcohol. I never saw my parents like sloshed or anything like that, but. Um, they enjoyed it. So, you know, and also, you know, deep fried foods and salt and all the stuff that's not the best for your system. Um, so yeah, so he was also like a little bit sick, you know, and he, he was slowing down and you know, how old, uh, when he moved back. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. I guess he would have been in his fifties. That's young though. Still. I guess like maybe 55 or something like that. And is your mom taking care of him pretty much? Yeah, I mean, not it wasn't that severe. I mean, he was still like moving around and working and doing housework and stuff, but it just got worse as he got older, like in the 70s. Um, you know, it just started emphysema, got worse, and he was having a hard time breathing. And I think he died when he was 80 in his 80s, 80, 82 or something like that, 81. And uh, yeah, it just it just you know, it just all heaped up on him and you know just is that the way that handle. works emphysema i mean i know you yeah. don't get rid of it but it's just a slow burn for some people and it just eventually just chokes you out yeah it basically Jesus. yeah because your your lungs stop being um uh flexible yeah. and um and elastic and malleable so like the tissue gets really hard and it gets harder and harder to breathe because you're just having to force it. and he was on oxygen you know h- hanging out and he, it just takes all the all your energy away you know so and then it turned into cancer and then he died yeah in the hospital my mom was there thankfully but i he died on his birthday which is no i I threw him a birthday party like a few days early and then i had to do a gig in chicago and i did a gig in chicago and i was going to come back and then i called the hospital they were like yeah he passed away i was like what it's like on his birthday which is insane how old 82 one it's like 81 82 he died on his fucking birthday yeah that is fucking insane i know and my mom died she predicted she would die in november no come on man this is wild what do you mean she's so when your when your dad died it was what month it was uh may uh fourth and are you saying your mom predicted she died november that same year or no. just she predicted her month her, death when month. she would die she would yeah she died many many years later my dad was like 80 and when and when i was 34 so i see so it was a while ago but um so she when you know was, she died last year and 
or I guess, yeah, last year. Yeah. She died last year and maybe five months before she died, she was like, I think I'm going to die in November. And was, was she sick at that point? Or yeah, she, just, she was, she was not, she just wasn't feeling well. She just, there was like a, a bunch of things going on and like, um, and she was also just tired. And then when I came back, cause my, I had the woman who was taking care of her was like, I think that you better come back home. And I was like, yeah, I'll be there. And I, next day I flew out to Montana and then we like hung out one night. And then the next day, the caretaker, uh, uh, she, yeah, she was, she leaves, she would leave at like four in the afternoon cause my mom wanted to be alone at night. And so she left at her home. She's at, at her, her home. At home. Yeah. Good. She's at home. So she she left, and then I went and got her dinner. Got her buffalo burger. She loves buffalo burgers, and so got that for her. She had a couple bites, not not a big appetite, and I like gave some to the dog. And she's like, "I think I'm ready to go to go to bed." And I helped her to bed, got her into bed, and then was just hanging out in bed with her, you know, just laying on the bed with the dog. And then she, do you remember what you talked about? Uh we didn't talk about a lot. I was just kind of hanging out with her. And just asking if she needed anything. And then I remember she like kind of sat up once, looked around the room, kind of like laid back down and sat up another time and looked around the room. And then when she laid back, I said like, I love you. And then she said, I love you too. And then she rolled over on her right hand side and then had like these kind of gasp, kind of like almost like sleep apnea, like holding your breath and then like letting go, sleep apnea, letting go. And then she passed away. You were there for that. Yeah. I mean, her literal last breath like that. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. It was crazy. That was, that was, it was a, I mean, I'm so glad that I had that moment with her and um, very, very surreal. But she, that was November 1st, which is also the day of the dead. It is. <laughs> it sure is. So like, it's just like both of my parents dying like in November crazy 1st. time periods on the cl- I'm just like, if this is a simulation, what do you do? It's the biggest wink. I gotta ask. My father died when um we were sixteen and I remember we found him in his bed. And, you know, there's a moment where you wanna spend some time with this person that's not there anymore. Yeah. So you're literally next to your mom. Mm-hmm. Do you call nine one one right away? Do you have a moment? What do you do? Like, I, I what had, do you do in I, that situation? I, I had a moment with her. You know, the dog was like the dog was like a young, energetic, uh, all black Shih Tzu. So he the whole time it was ridiculous. Like she's dying, and I'm like holding him <laughs> to stop like running around the bed while she's dying. So while stupid. Dying. Yeah. <laughs> So stupid. So she's like trying to die, you know, like in a nice way. Trying and this dog die. is like, rawr, rawr, rawr. I'm just like, God, oh, man, get over here. Stop it. Would you stop? And I'm like holding the, and I'm like, yeah, there she goes. She's like, oh, stop it. It's just like, it's so stupid. It was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. It was like very sad, but at the same time, also ridiculous. So crazy. Oh, man. That was crazy. That was crazy. Oh, shit. But, yeah, I was just kind of there and, and you know, holding the dog back. And then I just kind of like hung with my mom and like said some nice things to her and then gave her a kiss on the forehead. And then and then I called the woman the who, lady. Was, who was taking care of her. And uh, and then she she was very sad because she developed a, a relationship with my mom and she was really great. My mom liked her. And so she came over and then I told my friend Kelly, um, Kelly Stevens, who is I knew since grade school. And uh, he's always just been there for me, a really cool guy. And he worked, this is crazy, he worked for funeral homes. He used to pick up people after they passed. So he did that for 12 years. And uh, he, I called him and he knew exactly. He was just like, okay, well, call the cops. Um, they'll come over. Uh, and then I would call this funeral home. They're better than, you know, Crawford's better than these other guys. And I was like, okay, great. And you know, called the cops, uh, Brie came over, she was there. She was like very distraught, you know, came in and saw my mom. And then, and then like Kelly was there. He just like, just came in and he was very, very helpful. And then like the cops came, one of the cops knew Kelly. He was like, Hey Kelly. You know, it was like, Hey, and then his like partner went, it was like, I'm going to do a, a, an autopsy quick onsite autopsy. I'll be right back. And he went in and 
wrote down all the stuff, reports like, you know, natural causes, whatever. And then the funeral people came in and they knew Kelly, but there was like weird beef between him and the dude. <laughs> so one beef. guy didn't talk to Kelly, <laughs> but like the lady talked to him. And, and so you're welcome for the wreck, dick. Yeah, to- yeah. totally. Are it's you like, what is mom? happening right now? And dogs barking. It's just like dogs shit. barking. It's like, hey, Kelly. It's just like, it's just, it's you ridiculous. Y'all make this not about you right now. Yeah, please. totally. It's yeah. like, oh, I'll talk to you. Yeah, guys, can we just, just, can we just get through this? Uh, yeah. And then, you know, and then they, they got my mom and they, you know, I said, I think I went back one more time after they had done their thing and I just said goodbye to her. And then they, you know, put her in the, the bag and then put her on the, the gurney and took her outside. And then she was uh, cremated immediately like the next day and because uh, my mom wanted what my mom wanted and um then like i was going to a psychedelics conference like the the very next day or no the next day and so i was like i think i'm just gonna go i think i think i'd rather just go to that and then i came back right after the conference like it was two days and i came back and then went to the funeral home picked her back up picked the urn you know well i picked the urn before um over the catalog the phone and then uh they put her in the urn they came back got the urn they signed some paperwork and then yeah came home put the urn next to my dad's urn and uh yeah that was that was that was, uh, that was it it's crazy to feel like to know like you don't have parents anymore i know it's weird it's really it's a weird time it's like i don't think i've even processed you know what it is um you know, I I do see a psychologist, but we don't. I don't know what it is. I don't really talk about it. It's just something that I constantly think about, and I imagine at some point maybe there'll be more a time where I'm thinking a lot more about it. But well, you don't have siblings, no. And are you? Do you have any grandparents left on either side? No, no. Yeah, I guess not. They lived to be old. Old. They made it up there. Yeah, they did make it up there. So. Yeah. So you got nobody, Reggie. Uh, uncles? I ain't got nobody. Aunts? I do have uncles and aunts in France, but I, I've just never really kept up with them. And my mom had kind of a weird relationship with them. Um, and yeah, they, they later in life, she, she, she didn't really, she wasn't really talking to them that much. So, you know, the only uncle that really reaches out a lot is my uncle Manu. And um see your mom's brother. Yeah, my mom's uh half brother. Half brother. And uh that's it. And he reaches out all the time, but there's also a, a little bit of a language, even though I do speak French, I'm not like hyper fluent at writing it or um I don't know what it is. I just like I'm not as connected to them. Uh so I haven't really talked to them like after she passed. I mean he said like I'm sorry she passed and stuff like that, but you know, that was kind of it. Uh, so at some point I'll go back to France and say, Hey to them, you know, and bring some of my mom's ashes and kind of spread them, you know, in in Europe. But she wanted my, my dad and hers, her ashes, uh, spread out in Glacier National Park. So, uh, that's beautiful. So I'm going to do that at some point. Oh yeah. Yeah. That'll be a cool trip to take. Did you get to have any conversations with your dad about things before he passed? Or is he just again that that generation just like I don't we don't really talk yeah, about we our don't, feelings. We, we don't talk about feelings. <laughs> yeah. Feelings aren't real. Did you get one at the very end though? Did he slip one in on you at all? Not really. I mean, we talked about I think we talked about some stuff. But I remember he was also on some heavy painkillers. So I remember him getting up and thinking that there was like a fly on the ceiling, but there wasn't. It was just like a weird shadow, and we were talking about that. And then I remember he talked about how he thought the nurse was hot. <laughs> He's an eighty-one or two. Yeah, All and right. I was just like, okay, cool. <laughs> but I, I don't know. We we might have talked about it. nothing that I really remember. That was that he was just. I was just mostly just hanging out with him, and he would be like, you know, you don't have to be here. And I'm just like, I was like, that's no problem. I don't mind being, you know, whatever. It was. It was. You know, he was just kind of a quiet dude. Um, but I threw a party for him. It was really nice. All my That's friends nice. came and we had like birthday cake and wished him happy birthday. And I thought that that was really sweet. Um, I think he appreciated that. And uh, yeah, nothing too heavy. But I was I was glad I was there. I mean, I'm bummed that I couldn't be there when he passed past, but my mom was there for him. So that That's was cool. good. Do you, do you have any kids? No. Do you want kids? No. You don't want them? No, no, not interested. You have nieces and nephews. 
No, don't have no no sisters, no brothers. That's right. Duh. Yeah. Duh. Yeah, yeah. Cousins from your uncle over there? That's what I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, like there's the some cousins. Kids, there's some cousins. But no one you're close kids. with. No. Yeah. Reggie, you're on your own, bro. Yeah. At 50, that hits yeah. the first 50 years of your life. You at least have mom. Yeah. And now you're literally on your own. Yeah. A whole new world. <laughs> Does it scare you at all? Does it give you anxiety that you don't at least have a, someone to call and right. talk to about any fucking? I mean, I know you do. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah. Your friends, yeah, but yeah, I mean, is yeah, that yeah. you know, like I can't call sure. mom and ask her this. Yeah, I mean, I do think about that, um, but I, you know, I don't know. It's an interesting thing. It's mostly about like, well, what am I? What's my purpose in life? Like, what am I doing? You know, doing in life? Like, it definitely makes you think a little bit more about that. And I definitely thought about like kids, like in the sense that, you know, you my friends who have kids are like, oh man, my kid is so amazing. And I, I get all of that stuff, but it's still not enough for me to be like, I'm not really interested in that. I'm more interested in exploring the world. And I, I love kids in that I, I love like, you know, I'll talk to my friends, kids, you know, about art and, and improvisation or be silly with them and stuff. I love it. But, um, but I really like having my own time to myself and, doing what I need to do. And, um, that's fun. I love that shit. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm dealing with that now, you know, just like what I, I don't necessarily, I don't have like a full-time partner, you know, it's I was like gonna I'm ask dating. You see yourself getting married or I don't know. That's I don't know. That been, goes along with the same I, thing. I know. I know. I mean, I know <laughs> I got engaged twice when I was younger and just realized I really didn't want to get married. Um, I don't think I would get married. I could imagine like finding a partner and maybe having a ceremony or something like that. But I, I don't think I would want to get legally. I'm married. with you on that for real. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. The same. Have you been married before? I've been engaged to my daughter's mother, and then after a year, she was like, "Never mind." Oh, so, okay, so, yeah. Okay, yeah. No yeah. wedding. Uh, okay. No wedding. Okay. But yeah, I agree with doing something like the two of you go somewhere like i you know whatever go to italy yeah. get married yeah. and then come back and throw a party yeah totally because p.s party doesn't have the same price tag as wedding oh my gosh <laughs> especially on a saturday you're so you know? <laughs> so right about that i've been to so many weddings where i'm like why and then those people get divorced most most people mm -hmm. at least half statistically they do yeah yes. they'll get and i've been to weddings where they've been lavish and then like six years later five years later they're getting a divorce and i'm like it's a lot of money a and lot a lot of pressure of it yeah. puts a lot of pressure yes. on the situation you're like we want to be together and we're going to be together i think it's different if you i mean if it's i, I like the low-key weddings where you're like you can feel the love between them they're excited but it's not they're not making a big deal of it they're just what they just want to celebrate the fact that they're getting married and they have these amazing friends around them and their family's there and i love that i think that that's like such a beautiful way to do it when i've gone to more traditional like in a church you know with the super expensive wedding gown and all the nervousness and everyone mm -hmm. like and, and the wedding planner you know i'm like i'm just not into the wedding industry the wedding industrial complex well it's like, said it's like industry i yeah. think just That's it. i don't know save some money guys save some money guys just have a good fun fun party <laughs> well dude i hope you uh I hope you find whatever you're looking for solo out there, bro. Yeah, it's it's out there. There's there's fun stuff out there. Um, thank you for doing this for real. This has been great. Um, can I ask you now? Um, advice you would give to 16 year old Reggie Watts? Advice I'd give to 16 year old. Uh, I would say, um, God, I'd say try to try to get better at communicating your feelings. Um, especially romantically, like just get better at, re at, at communicating with people that you're romantic with probably the most. And why do you say that? What did something happen? I mean, we're all 16. Like you're just, yeah, but you're right. It's great advice. Yeah. <laughs> it's great advice. Well, cause like, you know, I loved, I, I like dating, you know, lots of people. And so I would see a lot of different women in different periods of my life, you know, but in even like my long-term relationships and things like that, I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know how to communicate so that I became more vulnerable. I didn't know how to become vulnerable. Yeah. And the vulnerability is what creates closeness. And so I was always trying to be like, oh, relationships are about fantasy and like perpetuating good times. And um, which is a sweet kind of notion, but it doesn't, it only gets you so far. And I think I would have maybe come up with some different realizations in life had I, 
practice that a little bit more, realize that that was important a little bit earlier. That's great advice. Yeah. Um, again, plug and promote. Plug uh, promote oh, yeah. all of it, bro. Plug no, and I, promote. I got my I got my special I'm filming in March. I think it's going to come out and on 420. Not totally sure, but that's the idea. And then, um, yeah, I have my book that's out in Great Falls, Montana. So you can get that wherever you get books. I also did an audio book, so you can listen to it as well. Awesome. Thank you very much for doing this show. Yeah. Uh, as always, Ryan Sickler on all social media, ryansickler.com. We'll talk to you all next week. Mm-hmm.